Good evening. And welcome to God's house on this observation of the coming of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. We see how Jesus sends his Holy Spirit down to the earth, down to Jerusalem specifically, as the church then is sent out into the earth, to the four corners of the earth with the Holy Gospel. We'll use the order of service, setting one of the service, beginning on page 154. We'll speak portions of the service as we go along this evening, but we'll begin with him 477. Page 154, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. 
Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Page 156. We'll speak these words together this evening. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. At Babel, sin led to God, confusing people's language. Grace would lead God to share the gospel in many languages on Pentecost. Genesis chapter 11. The whole earth had one language and a single vocabulary. As people traveled in the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used mud bricks instead of stone for building material, and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let's 
build a city for ourselves and a tower whose top reaches to the sky. And let's make a name for ourselves so that we will not be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. The Lord said, if this is the first thing they are doing as one people who all have one language, then nothing that they intend to do will be too difficult for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so that they cannot understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. It was named Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On Pentecost, the disciples proclaimed the gospel. Through their words, the Holy Spirit unleashed his power. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Please note where the congregation is invited to read. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the rushing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw divided tongues that were like fire resting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now there were godly Jewish men from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When the sound was heard, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were completely baffled and said to each other, look, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring in our own languages the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and perplexed. They kept saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said, they are full of new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what God says will happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a rising cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And this will happen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We turn to page 161 where we'll speak the acclamation together. We'll speak the alleluias together. And then the Easter verse, praise God for a living hope. Christ is risen from the dead. And then the alleluias at the end. Please stand. We acclaim together, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Praise God for a living hope. Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Through his word, Jesus sends us the Holy Spirit and gives us peace. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who does not love me does not hold on to my words. The word that you are hearing is not mine, but it is from the father who sent me. I have told you these things while staying with you, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you.
Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Hymn 585. 585. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Acts chapter 2. They were completely baffled and said to each other, Look, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? 
A while back, a friend recommended that I should watch a TV show about Danish politics, fictional, kind of like the West Wing set in Copenhagen, I guess. So of course I did it, but there's a problem when you watch a TV show about Danish politics set in Denmark. Everyone talks Danish all the time. So you end up reading a lot of subtitles and trying to see what the actors are doing while you're reading all the subtitles on the bottom of the screen. So that's what I did. But then something really surprised me because in the show, once in a while, these Danish people have to talk with Americans or British people, diplomats, colleagues, things like that. And they speak English. And so they switch to English and it's just a silly, dumb TV show, but I was shocked at what a wonderful thing it was to be able to hear them speak in English after an hour of Danish. It was like they were speaking my language and they were. If you ever lived overseas or worked there or just traveled and visited Europe or wherever, you probably have a sense of this, right? You're surrounded by unfamiliar sounds, syntax, vocabulary. It's not yours. And then you hear someone speaking English, your mother tongue, and it's great. It's just like a breath of fresh air. And it kind of roars into your brain and it just makes it feel great all over. Just to hear someone speaking in that unfamiliar environment your familiar language. Now, most likely, the pilgrims in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost knew Hebrew. We are told that though they lived all over the world, they were God-fearing Jews. And that means they would have known Hebrew, their forefathers' mother tongue, because their forefathers or great-great-grandfathers by that point would have built synagogues all over the known world. And on the Sabbath, they would have gathered together to listen to people talk in Hebrew, the Jewish language, the words of Moses and the prophets in Hebrew and a little Aramaic. So they would have known Hebrew. Now, since they were God-fearing Jews, we're told that, but there's also just the fact that they were there in Jerusalem on this special harvest Thanksgiving festival, because that's what Pentecost used to be. For us, it's the day the Holy Spirit came. For them, it was Pentecost Thanksgiving harvest festival. And they were there because they cared to be there on those special days at great expense, having probably traveled, some of them, hundreds and hundreds of miles to be there because they cared, because they believed, they trusted in the living God. And they would have been synagogue-going Jews who knew Hebrew. <clears throat> so what does that mean? I guess for me, and I hope for you, I find it fascinating that the Holy Spirit still chose on that special day to speak in their native tongues from all over the known world, instead of just saying everything he wanted to say in Hebrew. Go back about 150 years to our country, 1872, give or take. You have immigrants who came from Northern Europe for the most part, our ancestors, Germans and Swedes and Norwegians and Danes, and many others. And they came to the United States and they built churches. They gathered for worship and spoke their mother tongue, German, for example. But as time wore on, their kids, well, that's what grandpa talks. Grandpa talks German. Grandma talks German in the kitchen. That's what we use for confirmation class with Pastor Bugenhagen. 
That's what we sing our hymns in at church. 150 years ago, sure. But as time went on here in our country, the kids, and this happens in every single immigrant community around the world, the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation, they used the local language, English, more and more. So what I'm trying to say is, let's say it's 1872, we're in Fond du Lac, and some preacher from Leipzig or Berlin shows up, a red-blooded German German, and he just starts preaching full bore, full tilt, speaking really fast German. The kids, the grandkids, they probably could catch the gist, right? But are they gonna get everything? No. Grandma and grandpa, yeah, but not them. Because that's not their native language anymore. English was and is. Same with those Elamites and Parthians and Asians and people from Pontus and around Cyrene in Libya, in Rome. They spoke Latin. And so isn't it wonderful and thoughtful and smart and wise of the Holy Spirit Instead of just having all the apostles speak in Hebrew, which he could have done, it would have worked, he goes to the trouble to speak in all their native languages, their new mother tongues, so that there is no confusion at all as to the content that is being proclaimed. They're hearing in their own tongues the Christ who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The one who, who told parables, the one who suffered and died and rose and ascended and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty in their own language. A side wonderful aspect of it is it makes it pretty clear that this gospel is not just for Jerusalem or just for Jews, but for the whole world, for every language that there is. And indeed, that is the point of the church to this very day. A chunk of your offerings, of your rich and generous gifts, goes to our synod, our national church body, and a chunk of that money goes to fund multi-language publications in all different languages. There are hundreds and thousands of languages and dialects. We're only able to cover a couple of dozen or so, but still, that's not bad. I like to read to you the languages that we do have stuff in, material that proclaims Christ to you right now. Albanian, Arabic, Bulgarian, Burmese, Chewa, Mandarin, Chinese, Haitian, Creole, Czech, Dutch, Farsi, Finnish, French, Georgian, like the one in Asia, Hindi, Hmong, Hungarian, Indonesian, Italian, Japanese, Kazakh, Korean, Kurdish, Laotian, Latvian, Luvale, Miso, Nepali, Norwegian, Pashto, Polish, Portuguese, Punjabi, Russian, Spanish, Swedish, Telugu, Thai, Tibetan, Tonga, Tumbuka, Ukrainian, Urdu, Vietnamese, Turkish. One of the great things about being part of a synod is that we're able to pool our money together to produce materials that proclaim Christ in those languages. And of course, other church bodies are probably covering some of the languages we can't get to. The work of the Christian church is to proclaim Christ in our own languages. From the Greek and the Hebrew of the original Bible, the word of God, and then to make that known throughout the world to every tribe, nation, and language. Praise be to Christ and his Holy Spirit for giving us the wisdom to do that very thing. And so, it is a treat to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in your own language. It's a privilege that we don't want it to be a barrier to anyone. And so 
Maybe you know someone who's learned other languages. Maybe it's for work or for school. But maybe you know someone who was a missionary or is one now who goes to the trouble to learn another language so that they can communicate Christ and what his death means. What does it mean? It means that he loves us so much that he came to wash away our sin. And the only price that was big enough to wash it away was his own blood, his own righteousness shed on the cross, given for us. Maybe some of you have even tried to learn at least a little bit of another language, just to build a bridge to speak to someone else from another nation who lives here. That's good work. And indeed, I bet it probably expands your own horizons as well in ways that you never thought possible. The ability to speak, whether it's your own tongue that your mother taught you or a new one that you grudgingly tried to learn in high school or maybe later on in life thought it would be a good idea to try to learn a new language for whatever reason, to live in another language is wise and a good gift from the Holy Spirit, the one who gives us tongues and brains and ears and vocabulary, grammar, syntax, and all the rest of it. He indeed is the one who decided to use Greek and Hebrew and now English and around the world, every other language. This is that ongoing joy of Pentecost. Some say it's about speaking in inintelligible talk, gibberish, basically. There are people in our community who have been taught that that's what it means. That is not correct. The joy of Pentecost is speaking in known languages, like English, your language, and saying that around the world abroad, in your own home, in your own congregation. That is the joy of Pentecost, because he is the one who decided to be speaking our language. In Jesus' name, amen. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We turn to page 162. Page 162 and 163, the Nicene Creed Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for prayer.
We'll join together in the prayer of the church on page 164. 164. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Our rich and generous offerings are presented at the altar. Page 165, the preface to the sacrament will speak the words of the preface this evening. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day kept his promise and poured out the Holy Spirit to empower his church to proclaim the gospel in all the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. Page 170, 170. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with a saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for the final hymn.
warm welcome to all of you here this evening, both our visitors and members here in God's house here at St. Peter's. Please stick around, families, for our fire and fellowship right after the service. Uh, depending on our numbers, we'll either play kickball or do gaga pit. So we'll see who is out there by the garage, and uh, we'll start our evening there, and then uh, proceed with the rest of it as the evening goes on. On Sunday, for parents of little ones, our cradle will work our cradle roll workshops begin. That's after the late service on Sunday. So please join us at around 11 o'clock. And the location change, we were gonna be in the multi-purpose room, but we'll be in the consulman's conference room over on the other side of the narthex. So note that, parents of little ones. In one week, we'll be celebrating a very special milestone, uh, the retirement of our beloved member and friend, Ann Stefan. And so please do take that into consideration. There is a card box on the information station to help celebrate this wonderful milestone of all her dedication for our young people over these years. So please do take that into consideration this evening and this weekend with the festivities next Thursday and Sunday during all three services. Baseball games, there's a couple of different ones you can sign up for. There's the Wells Night at the Brewers, that's in the information in the Narthex. There's also the Doc Spiders game coming up on the 12th of July. Check those out as well. And the last thing I was going to mention was the fact that wasn't important. Have a great night. See you out by the fire pit. <laughs>